So good morning again. And uh, <laughs> nice to see uh, everybody who's here in person and to see everybody on video. So uh, welcome to our, our meeting. And as usual, we will start the board meeting with our land acknowledgement. The Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that the land upon which we are undertaking our revitalization efforts is part of the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. In addition, Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that Toronto has historically been a gathering place for many Indigenous people, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabek, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples and is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples today. So now I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the meeting agenda, but just before we do that to accommodate some scheduling and to address a new matter uh, that we're going to discuss, uh, we're going to go back to what we traditionally did, which was to um, have our uh, closed session with directors and without directors um, before we go back into open session. So um, what I'm going to suggest is that item 19 be moved up so that it's dealt with at the end of the closed session before we go back into open and the new item be added to the closed session to discuss indigenous consultation. And that new matter will be item 15. The director's only discussion will be item 16 uh, following the agenda and then we'll go back into open. So I would ask if there is a mover and a seconder for that. Alicia and Leslie, thank you. So now, um, then, uh, now we've approved the meeting agenda. So now I'll ask if there are any declarations of conflicts of interest. Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on. So once again, I wanna thank everyone for attending. And also, once again, as usual, to thank our government partners for their participation today and for their ongoing support of Waterfront Toronto. And I'd also like to thank all levels of government for once again agreeing to extend my appointment to June 30th of this year. Now, we do have a, a big agenda, so we'll uh, get right into it. The next is the consent agenda. Uh, and as usual, I'm assuming that that will serve as a summary. Um, and we can move on then to the uh, minutes of the open session of December 8th. And again, could I have a motion to approve the December 8th meeting? Uh, Kevin and Alicia again, thank you. Um, and now I'll turn the floor over to George for the uh, CEO report. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm gonna try and make this short because most of the items are actually in the, um, in the rest of the meeting. So key side, as I reported earlier, oh, by the way, Steve, thank you for uh, actually staying on to the end of June. So let me start with that because uh, I know that's taken up a lot of your time. Um, key side uh, continues to proceed. Um, we will get into more details, but uh, we uh, successfully closed and continue our discussions. And now we're focused on issues like uh, uh, government funding for affordable housing is being part of the discussions going forward, but we'll update you later in the uh, board meeting on that. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, if the board recalls, one of the key components was to work with the staff to not only look at the demographic survey, but also to establish um, uh, values and purpose, which uh, was reported to HRTRC, uh, GRC, um, and one of the uh, outcomes of that is a bottom-up value statement and purpose statement coming from the staff. Um, so that'll be reported on later. The flood protection, we continue to work with uh, uh, governments with regards to continuing that project. It's moving forward. Uh, and I think David and the team are doing a great job. We'll report back as to where we're at on that. And I'll talk a bit about the government uh, funding ask in the future. Um, Office relocation will still targeted to move at the end of the year, so uh, everything's moving forward. We're continuing to work with our designers now on that. Um, Steve, I will probably ask you or a couple people from the board uh, for a little bit of input as we're designing the board room itself. Um, so we'll uh, reach out through you to Great. get a couple members there. Um, Villiers Island is the next big project that we continue to work on. Uh, 
we have the BIP that uh, is moving forward. Uh, we'll be reporting to you, the board later today, uh, this morning, on basically some of our thoughts as we move forward. Also looking at increasing our density projections there, working with the city and, and CREATO as we try to address the huge uh, deficit in housing supply at this point. Uh, so we'll report on that. And I think I'll just leave it at that, Steve, and leave time for the rest of the meeting. Great. Are there any uh, questions of George? Okay, I don't see any. So uh, moving on, uh, we'll look at the uh, or discuss the committee reports. Uh, I'll take them as read, but uh, I'll ask Kevin, is there anything in terms of the farm report that you want to add? I know we met on uh, February 23rd and I've covered a number of things. Only two of them are for approval of the board today, both of which the, the farm committee is recommending. We'll hear more from David on the Broadview East uh, flood protection the procurement and um, made some amendments to our rolling five year strategic plan that necessitated necessitated by the negotiations that have been going on on our uh, buddy shortfall at uh, Portlands. Um, so we'll update the board on that. Um, the uh, I would note that the the impact of the Eastside development is going to be reflected in our financial statements next quarter, not this quarter. So uh, There'll be some changes that we'll have to go through. We did make a change in our accounting policy that was recommended by our auditors. It's fairly esoteric and I won't go into all the details. Suffice to say it better matches our development cost, capital development cost revenues, uh, and that'll be reflected in our year-end statement so we can discuss it more at that time. And uh, we got an update from our internal audit partners at, uh, at MNP and um, everything is in good shape there. So. Um, I'll deal with a few more items in closed session, but uh, that's the, that's my report. Right. Um, any questions of Kevin? Right. Okay, Wendy. Uh, anything that you'd like to add from the uh, public agenda? Sure, uh, thanks. Ahead. Thanks, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Um, as noted in my chair report, our committee met on March. 8th and uh, I'm pleased to report that our entire committee was there and that we welcomed Councillor Malik for her first meeting since joining the board and her insight is very much appreciated um, and in terms of the report we'll hear more about the details uh, today on our climate action plan but uh, we also received a detailed report from Rose regarding HR matters and the committee appreciated uh, that update but the full report is uh, on board effect for any and any director that's interested in reviewing um, and then we'll address a few more items in closed session Steve so that's it on this end right uh, well done any any uh, questions of Wendy <coughs> okay seeing none uh, Jack do you have anything to add in terms of the IREC report you're muted Uh, nope, thank you, Steve. I don't have anything to add other than to say that uh, we're about to see a presentation on Villiers Island, which I think is very exciting and it's a piece of wonderful work done by our team. So uh, with that, pass it back to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, so continuing on, uh, it has been our practice to receive an update on our environmental, social and governance matters, ESG. So we're going to receive a report on our climate action plan. So Lisa Taylor, I will turn the floor over to you at this point. Great, thanks Stephen. Good morning everyone. For this quarter's ESG update, I am pleased to welcome two of my colleagues, Anton Toyasak, who is Waterfront Toronto's interim uh, director of corporate, sorry, interim director of innovation and sustainability, and Ella Liu, who is our seed panelist of the reporting. And this morning, Anton and Ella will share with the board the four pillars of our climate action plan, which aims to respond to the risks um, associated with climate change, as well as the transition to a low carbon economy, all with a view to enhancing our overall position in, in climate leadership. So Anton, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you, I'm sure, man. If you could present the uh, slide deck, thank you. So uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're excited to present uh, Waterfront Toronto's first climate action plan. Uh, next slide. And uh, you may ask, well, why did we work on a climate action plan? There are really three reasons why we worked on a climate action plan. Uh, reason number one is stakeholder alignment. 
So uh, the most uh, aggressive uh, climate action plan uh, target for net zero comes from the city of Toronto. So they want to get to net zero by 2040. Uh, that's followed by uh, the, the federal government that has a net zero uh, target of 2050 and, and an associated climate action plan. And that's followed by uh, also provincial goals for greenhouse gas reductions. For example, 80% uh, greenhouse gas reduction by 2050. Reason number two is uh, risk management. So back in 2021, Waterfront Toronto identified climate risk as a top 10 enterprise risk. That led to Waterfront Toronto's first TCFD report, which is Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure Gap Analysis. So a number of climate risks were identified with this third party report. So Waterfront Toronto's Climate Action Plan is actually a response to uh, the TCFD uh, report. And the third reason why we did a climate action plan is because of organizational commitments. So it's uh, very much tied to our values and very much tied to uh, the legacy of Waterfront Toronto being a leader in sustainability. So next slide, please. So for a little bit of background, when I talk about scope one, two and three GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, scope one, the, the simplest way to uh, look at it is it's that boiler that heats your building. So we're in a building here, it's heated by boiler. That's scope one, that's a direct uh, emission. Scope two is indirect. So think of it in terms of the plug load, the plug load that we use for our computers in, in this room. Scope three are purchased goods and services and uh, activities that get captured by a, for example, a contractor that we manage. So uh, Portland's flood protection construction project uh, emissions would be scope three emissions. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the strategy, basically the five year strategy. And uh, what we have on the left hand side are the four responses to the TCFD report, that independent report. So um, we're dealing with um, risks that are linked to a need for GHG reductions, possibly a net zero target, low carbon procurement, stakeholder engagement, and establishing governance. Just being mindful of time, I'll, I'll run through the uh, the top one, the GHG one, which is the most uh, resource intensive. And uh, really across the top, uh, year one was all about developing the climate action plan. Year two will be more about integrating the plan across the corporation and externally. And year three to five uh, is really about driving the performance of the climate action plan. So to run through uh, the top uh, mitigation goal uh, related to the TCFD report, uh, we have to look at some sort of GHG reduction plan. So in year one, we, uh, we were quite busy. It's a lot of work to calculate our scope one and two, but more importantly, our scope three emissions. And we have about six months of data right now. So our preliminary results show that scope one and two, again, the more direct, is less than 5% of our footprint. Another way of putting this is that uh, more than 95% of our GHG emissions uh, are scope three. So for example, uh, those indirect emissions from construction and procurement. So this highlights the importance of supply chain management and addressing climate risk. In terms of preliminary uh, results, we see that uh, procurement of steel, diesel, and granular are the top three uh, procurement materials that uh, are the most intense for GHGs. So for year two, we need to collect and assess a full year of data. And uh, we need to ensure that the quality of data is there. You know, we have to deal with some proxy issues. There's a lot of different methods uh, that can be used. We, we get advice from a third party. We need to uh, align as well to federal funding. Uh, for example, Infrastructure Canada Climate Lens funding requires projects to show that GHG accounting on a project basis. So once we have a full baseline, we can work on a reduction roadmap. And what I'd like to do is present a range of options for this roadmap. So uh, I, I'm from Oshawa uh, hometown, so the Cadillac version 
uh, would be uh, coming up with a net zero target by 2040 to match what, uh, uh, what the city of Toronto has. A more of a medium version, maybe a Malibu, uh, would be to, uh, to work with GHG accounting on a project by project basis, which kind of aligns with that federal funding. And, uh, you know, at the lower end of the spectrum uh, would be work that's more policy related in terms of uh, uh, looking at aligning our procurement policy uh, for low carbon procurement on a long term uh, with a long term strategy. So. In terms of uh, early lessons learned. Uh, early consideration of low carbon design uh, is is one early lesson. Uh, if you incorporate low carbon into you know early design, then then you're kind of ahead of the game. Uh, number two early lesson is uh, we learned to ask questions. So we learned to ask, uh, you know, where where did this uh, aggregate come from? Where did this piece of steel come from? And uh, when when you do that, you start having people in the industry actually look at uh, the carbon intensity of products, and it starts changing the industry a little bit. So early lesson number three, Waterfront Toronto's impact, and this is fairly obvious, is in the scope three emissions, um, for example, construction procurement. So a greenhouse gas reduction roadmap would look at opportunities for low carbon procurement, uh, in particular for constructions. So next slide, next steps. So we will continue to report we will continue to report to uh, the senior management team on a quarterly basis and to the board uh, with uh, regular updates. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, is it realistic <laughs> to get to uh, 2040 to have net zero? Yeah, so that would be the Cadillac version uh, of a plan. Uh, the City of Toronto has it. Uh, they have an aggressive uh, target of. Uh, net zero by 2040 it um it would be challenging it would be challenging uh there would have to be a look at uh, current resources and uh an outline of resources required leslie so similar question so it's not clear to me the amount of investment these different cars uh that you've talked about uh would require so just trying to understand you know the amount of effort, uh, the return on the investment. So, if we did invest more, could we accelerate? Or, like, I'm just trying to put money or resource against these three because yeah. theoretically it's small, medium, large. I get it, but I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. if there is an urgency on climate action, is it worth? I'm just trying to get a scale. Yes, yeah, so so. what we're talking about financially. Yeah, very good point. It's not very... net because there's. There's okay, George, George, I think yeah. yeah, just uh, Leslie, to your point, <clears throat> I think as we come forward with Villiers, for example, because that's supposed to be the next net positive uh, project, we're going to have to report back what we think that cost would be because that's going to come out of the land sale revenues in terms of offsetting it. So I think to your point, we'll report back to the board what we think the cost of that policy objective would be. But are we taking, so that's one big project, yeah. there's others. Are yeah, we yeah. taking a macro view of it? Because we are, it may be that one, that one's harder, the other one's, I, I don't know why, just, yeah. I'm asking, because I think just taking it project by project might not be the best lens on something that's so system-wide. Yeah, and we are looking, and as Lisa would report, <laughs> our, our uh, metrics are on the broader, broader targets, right? Yeah, I guess yeah, so part, part of this, Sorry, uh, there was a question. Uh, yes, Rule. Sorry, and uh, Laurie. Okay. Yes, Rule then Laurie. Sure, thanks for that. Just to follow up, first of all, congratulations. Really important work to, to be doing. I think uh, my questions are twofold. When you bring this forward next time, what would be really interesting is to get a handle on what's driving your decisions and determining what targets we're actually aiming for. I'd be particularly interested in that. And related to that um, is, uh, where's the Paris Agreement fit in or not fit in? And the reason I raise that is that we have KPIs that are UN SDG focused, so they are actually global. So if there's an opportunity to connect what we're doing within the Paris Agreement framework, that could be helpful. If it doesn't fit, that's fine too. But I'd be just curious to hear about that as you move this forward. Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, very much a direct connection to the Paris uh, Agreement. So. Uh, the whole reason we look at a net zero target is to uh, 
um, try and ensure that uh, we can manage within a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. Uh, so that is the, you know, the uh, why why we would set these targets. Uh, really, in the next year, what we want to do is get a full year of baseline of GHG emissions on the scope three side. It's a lot of work. Uh, once we have that uh, information, uh, then we want to work on that roadmap that looks at uh, the cost benefit uh, at each of those three levels that I outlined. So, so we want to, uh, you know, first kind of get a handle of of what our footprint is, because uh, right now all we have is six months. Uh, but for future presentations, we'd like to present uh, those options uh, uh, with some rigor in terms of uh, resources. Uh, uh, Laurie. Um, great. I, I, first of all, I think this is great work to be undertaking, very timely. Uh, my question is on uh, page 28 of the, the scopes, one, two, and three, and then there's an out of scope section that deals with, that suggests projects carried out by development partners is out of scope for, for and I, I'm not sure if it's for the whole package of work or just for a subset, but um, I'm presuming through the procurement process and I know through the, that there are targets and objectives set out for developer partners and, and George just spoke to the impact of that going to the land value. And I'm just curious where that fits in relative to these scopes. What are the standards set today? Uh, or maybe if you could just remind me of that. And it, is this work looking to set higher standards going forward with future development procurement? Uh, yeah, so thank you for the question. So uh, there is a very you know set protocol, ISO types of standards that apply to defining you know scope one, two, and three. Uh, so it basically comes down to um, ownership and operational control. So. Uh, when we sell, when we transfer land, it's actually no longer in our scope three. Uh, so, for example, when Keyside development uh, transfers to to developers, uh, that's no longer part mm -hmm. of our scope three. So, uh, scope three would be our direct delivery of, of construction. Having said that, our green building requirements apply uh, to um, you know the deals that we make with our development partners for for Keyside and Villiers Island. Can I can I add to that? So, Laura, I think what you're asking is what control do we have over our development partners? And for the buildings, they have to hit certain targets. So we've got our green building requirements. We also have to hit TGS Tier Three, which is way beyond what um, the market is doing right now. So we push our developers much past that. Billiers will be even more stringent. Um, each project we try and up the bar. Um, I think the question maybe is, should we be looking at um, in our procurement with our developers, their procurement policies and and whether or not they or are their using performance. Yeah, because like the building, it can, like it has to perform at a certain level when delivered. But what about their materials that they're they're sourcing their trucking their you know are they using electric uh, diesel etc so um i i think that's a really good question we've not gone down the you know the supply chain that way so far with our developers but maybe we should be the only other thing i would add that, to that Lori, is that when we assess uh the vendors when they you know they uh, are up for procure or one of our procurements we would look at their past performance as we yeah. evaluate them. So that broader experience and their protocols would be embedded in our evaluation of whether they get extra points uh, towards that objective. Yeah. Yeah, Alicia. I have one more and then uh, great, great deck is actually quite informative and um, kind of easy to easy to figure out. Um, just a question given, I guess, 95 percent is scope Maybe it's a question for for uh, Meg. Um, I mean, I guess this is a something that through policy procurement policy, uh, hopefully will be you know decent to tackle. But Meg, do you is your sense that um, the industry and in your discussions is getting on board and that we won't be the only people putting this pressure on them? Right. I mean, I'm sure lots of people around the table could speak to this. I think companies at large are are 
reporting on ESG, they're all focused on this. Um, I think there are probably very few that are not. Um, certainly, um, I think the development industry and Steve and Jack and Lori probably can answer better than I can, but I think it is a focus, particularly because buildings, I don't know, Anton, buildings are worth two thirds of what we put into the atmosphere. Yeah. Transportation is the other big one. So I, I'm going to throw Alicia, it. No, I, I'll just say one thing. Um, uh, there are certain things that we can do, but the one thing I've been personally frustrated with is, you know, concrete, mm -hmm. uh, for example, emits carbon. But I have not yet seen a viable alternative in the industry to date. I mean, there's been experiments going on. I tried else been experimenting. So with every contract, I think right? what we have to hope, I believe, over time is that innovation uh, will allow us to meet some of these targets. Steve, if I can just add to Alicia's question, when we put out the RFP, uh, the second RFP with regards to Keysight, we had very strong and, and very high expectations for uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. They actually exceeded what we asked for. Exactly. So that told me the industry actually gets the fact that they need to do this. Um, so that yeah. was a market driven decision. Yeah, I, just, I think there's opportunity given yeah. it's 95% of what's happening yeah. here, yeah. but it, it, you know, it also is dependent upon our partners too. Yeah. And I and I I'm gonna look into what I think was Lori's question was about their supply chain and if we should be um, digging a little deeper when we I'll just add one other thing. Consumers who are buying our product are very much aware of these issues and so they want you know, the industry to accomplish these objectives. So everybody's working towards them. Okay, great discussion. I'm gonna move on. Thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Uh, David, can I ask you to give us a brief update on our priority projects? And I guess the, uh, go ahead, we'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to um, do a little tour of the waterfront from west to east uh, in photos. See where we are on our uh, uh, current project um, uh, list. Next slide, please. First is uh, Love Park. Uh, Love Park is nearing completion. Um, we'll be ready for uh, prime time and opening once we complete the uh, commissioning of the um, water feature. So that hasn't been done yet, whether it's allowed us to do that. But once that's done, uh, the park will essentially be ready. So you can see here the dog off leash area. Um, and this is just over at York and Queens Key. Next. And here a photo of the um, pond on the right, uh, the heart-shaped pond, and on the left, the uh, pavilion or trellis uh, being constructed. Next, please. Moving to East Bayfront to the inwater pipes um, will be uh, substantially complete in the next couple of weeks. Allow us to begin to um, um, turn over the entire stormwater system to the City of Toronto um, once this project is completed. Uh, next, uh, T3 Bayside, our future home, um, is uh, coming along well. They'll be uh, substantially complete this summer. Uh, and in fact, um, as soon as we're ready, uh, we can actually start construction on our space, although we're not ready yet. Next. Uh, in West Dawnlands, um, there is uh, Block 10 uh, coming along. This is one of the uh, cameras used for Block 10. Um, I am not sure when they're planning to be complete, however. Um, back in East Bayfront, do you know me? I don't, but I will find out for you. Uh, back in East Bayfront, uh, Limberlost Place, uh, the second wood building going up uh, for George Brown College. Um, here you can see a couple of views of the building. They go up very, very quickly once they get started. The, uh, the wood is a, new, uh, a very, very fast uh, method of construction. Um, I think our next is a video actually uh, featuring uh, previous board member Joe Cressy now with George Brown College. Do, can you get that started? Welcome to Toronto's East Bayfront community. This is an exciting and growing mixed-use neighborhood. It's a place where you can live, work, play, 
and even learn. George Brown College is one of the big reasons this is such a great place to be. In our latest project, a mass timber building right here called Limberlost Place, well, it's gonna make this neighborhood even better. Our net zero carbon emissions building will provide an amazing new learning space for George Brown students, but it's also gonna house a brand new community childcare facility, as well as a research hub called the Brookfield Sustainability Institute. This research hub is where we will work with government, nonprofit organizations, and the private sector to develop those innovative solutions to the challenges created by climate change. As a college located in the heart of downtown Toronto, we champion efforts that benefit our students and the entire city. We're helping the city retain its top talent by contributing to the growth of a more livable and accessible Toronto. What's really amazing about Limberlost Place is in addition to delivering a really incredible piece of architecture, it set very ambitious targets from a sustainability perspective, but not at the expense of design excellence. It's still a really wonderful place to visit and contribute positively to the community it's being built within. This was once an underutilized industrial zone, but we helped to change that through the establishment of our waterfront campus, which opened right here with the Daphne Cockwell Center for Health Sciences in 2012. Six years later, the School of Design moved into the Daniels Waterfront City of the Arts Complex, and in 2025, we'll welcome students and the wider community to Toronto's next iconic building, Limberlost Place. All of us here at George Brown are very proud to be a key partner in the development of an accessible and environmentally sustainable waterfront community. We can't wait to welcome you to Limberlost Place. Thanks, Charmaine. Um, David, before we move on, I just wanted to point out Love Park which is right next door to us, is coming along extremely well. Very positive responses from the public and the neighborhood. So we're working with the city and our government partners to look at how we could uh, launch that opening uh, come probably in June. The challenge we have is we have no mayor right now to work with, so uh, we have an acting mayor that we're trying to work through. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to um, Portland's Flood Protection Lakeshore Boulevard. So you can see here the uh, bridge abutments for the uh, west eastbound Lakeshore uh, Bridge. Um, we are nearing completion of the structure. Uh, we'll commence the dredging to remove the uh, uh, soil underneath the extended bridge and are um, forecasting to have that bridge completed this fall and the uh, westbound bridge then uh, under construction. Next. Yeah, Portland's flood protection. This is our um, propeller shot, propeller, the firm that does this. Um, so we can see the entire project. Um, really uh, interesting to get this done once a month. Um, and it's hard to see at this scale, but um, you can actually, um, it's incredibly detailed once you get down to the uh, uh, finer grained areas. So we can keep track of materials, um, quantify soils and soil piles. Um, it's quite a useful tool. Next. Um, this is the uh, ice management area, uh, so we're uh, probably a, a month or two away from completing all of the armor stone um, up to the uh, Commissioner Street Bridge uh, that forms the, um, the river, uh, river base or the river bottom here, uh, and that is to protect the river from any ice coming down from the Don River uh, in the spring, um, and this uh, same finish will actually carry up right to the, uh, where we meet the Eden Channel. Next, um, Canoe Cove, um, the five islands have now been uh, constructed. Um, some final finishing going on, that'll be done this year. Um, so the, uh, the Canoe Cove will be completed uh, and we'll begin uh, this spring working on uh, Promontory Park South, um, which is directly to the north of Canoe Cove. Next. Uh, up in the sediment debris management area, excavations happening. Um, we're um, constructing foundations uh, and uh, dock walls to uh, provide for the uh, future set of uh, SDMA. Um, we are building this on an interim basis because of the gardener. Once the gardener has been uh, realigned, then the final work in the SDMA can be completed um, around about 2030. Next. Um, here a photo that shows both the Cherry Street North Bridge uh, and, uh, and the tra 
LRT, LRT bridge next to it uh, and the Cherry Street South Bridge, which is uh, currently in operation. And that's the yellow one at the uh, at the east end. Um, sometime in um, August or September, we will open Cherry Street from Lakeshore Boulevard um, through to Cherry Street uh, South and the South Bridge. Uh, that'll happen. Um, there should be a celebration when that happens, uh, at least for the car drivers, truck users, Portlands. Right. If if no one else. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Um, in the uh, future uh, River Park North, we've got uh, started the um, storm drainage uh, system. We've also started electrical systems, so work has commenced in the parks, and um, that will be a. a main focus for us along with the roads this year uh, parks will happen over the course of the next two years um, looking to uh, completion at the end of 2024 next and that's all for right our Look, photos very impressive so much going on um any questions sorry who had a question i i have a question yeah it's councillor malik yeah, go can ahead. Yeah, yep. we can. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for the for the presentation and those those updates. I did want to return to just uh, Love Park, and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm around its opening, and and we're watching it closely. Um, I think it's a, just a really incredible success story of the City of Toronto and Waterfront Toronto's uh, collaboration and partnership. Um, I'm glad to hear that there is a timeline for June. And I don't think that the um, the lack of a, a permanent mayor should be a, um, something that slows down our planning of a celebration and public opening. Um, I would love to know who is leading that work at Waterfront Toronto and the City of Toronto and how my office can um, support in those efforts. If June is the timeline, you'll know that it won't be until June 26th where we'll have some certainty around that. And we are in regular contact with the deputy mayor's office and and uh, especially with something like this, we don't want to um, uh, miss uh, miss an opportunity. Yeah, so, uh, if I can answer Asma, it's George. Um, we are working through our communications branch uh, with the mayor's. With the mayor's office and we'll get to the name of the individuals. Uh, there was some concern on our behalf that there seems to be a little bit of desire to potentially delay it till July. Uh, when we do have a new mayor, we, we are worried uh, about how long. So we'll work with your office uh, to include you in those conversations with the city. Thank you. Okay, great. OK, moving on. The next item is the uh, Broadview Eastern Flood Protection Update. Um, and a recommendation. Uh, I understand Farm has approved this, Kevin. I think you spoke approved, about it. Yeah. Um, uh, David, you want to just briefly go I, over it? I will. I'll go very quickly. Um, the what we are uh, presenting today is a recommendation for the form of construction uh, contract uh, that we are going to procure um, for the uh, Broadview Eastern project. We do have uh, an initial capital approval from. Uh, the board of directors uh, to undertake design and to um, procure our uh, contractor. Um, we're procuring the contractor now uh, for a variety of reasons that I'll, I'll speak to, um, but um, uh, two of the reasons are that there are uh, commitments that have been made by the city to um, the uh, province and the developer of East Harbor um, to retain a contractor. Um, and have that contractor actually commence or mobilize work um, before the end of this year. Um, so that's one of the conditions or one of the criteria we took into account uh, in assessing how to proceed. Next slide, please. Uh, no, keep going. There we go. Um, so just a uh, very quick update um, on the status of the project. Design is underway. We're working um, uh, quite a bit of work is going on. Discussions are going on with the province, uh, Metrolinx, uh, Create TO, uh, sorry, and um, uh, the City of Toronto to determine um, what the project ultimately will um, look like. Um, although there's been an EA, uh, the landowner for the property that the um, flood protection landform is uh, to be constructed on has requested the province look at some alternatives. So we're doing that with the province now um, and uh, anticipate that uh, in the next um, in the next 
weeks and months, we will uh, be able to determine what exactly it is we're going to do to provide flood protection. And this is important because it will, it is actually the last piece that's necessary to provide flood protection for everything east of uh, the Don River um, and the Don Roadway. Uh, it, um, it is required once uh, the Ontario government proceeds with the Ontario line and uh, removes the rail embankment um, that will become the future um, transit hub for East Harbour Station. Next. Um, just gave you a bit of the background. Um, so next slide. Was, uh, uh, that's the area in question. On the south side is the embankment, north side Eastern Avenue, and then the Don River to the west. Uh, next. Um, the ultimate plan is to provide a flood protection landform from the embankment to Eastern Avenue. Um, that uh, cannot be done in this fashion um, at the moment because the BMW um, uh, dealership that is located on this property uh, is situated essentially in the alignment of the FPL. Uh, so under the terms of the um, EA, there was a phasing option proposed, which is on the next slide. Um, a, an FPL at the north end um, um, at Eastern Avenue, an FPL tying into the um, uh, rail abutment at the south end, and then a temporary grading solution between the existing building um, and, uh, and those um, FPLs. And this was a critical component in determining um, what sort of project or what sort of contract to enter into uh, and to procure. And I'll get to that now. Um, so move on. Next slide, next slide. Um, just a, another note that um, lots of other projects going on that we need to coordinate with um, also affects our um, decision on how to proceed and what kind of contract to issue. Next slide, please. So here's the key considerations. We want early contractor involvement to help us um, uh, determine uh, constructability uh, and um, how the phasing should work. Um, we've got some critical approvals that will impact the design and uh, when we're able to start the work. Um, we need to align with the uh, design work that's already been procured. Um, looking to be uh, have an open book, transparent um, uh, process with the contractor. Uh, and um, we also need uh, to get this uh, awarded in the, uh, in the imminent future. Next. Uh, I'll just skip these because there's a summary. Let's go to the summary table, Charmaine, that um, summarizes the various options that we assessed. Um, so, the, oh, nope, back, went too far. Can we go back, please? Sure. Thank you, right here. Um, so we looked at a uh, number of options. One was just a, a lump sum, a stipulated sum general contractor option. Uh, we looked at design build. Um, uh, construction management, uh, general contract, uh, construction management negotiated uh, guaranteed maximum price and the CM negotiated stipulated price. Um, our analysis uh, based on the um, requirements, uh, which include, you know, pre-construction services, uh, design approvals, cost certainty, um, the overall cost of the project, schedule adherence, risk transfer, um, and uh, Having an open book uh, process, um, you can see that um, the weighted totals um, weigh to the uh, uh, the construction manager general contractor uh, solution. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. One is that uh, it's a phased project that will happen in uh, in multiple phases, uh, beginning prior to the uh, full design being completed. Uh, so stipulated sum would be very difficult, if not impossible. Um, the design build, uh, again, we don't yet quite know what we're designing, so procuring a design builder would be difficult uh, and costly. Um, and that then leaves the construction management uh, solutions, which provide us the most um, flexibility in terms of how to uh, proceed with the work in phases and uh, uh, and uh, sequential design. But what's the, um, in picking that choice, what's the incentive for the manager to come in at the lowest cost possible? As, as they go through the 
Well, so the they're going to have to procure um, each of the components. So about 90% of the total cost will be done on a um, uh, competitive procurement basis. So they're um, they're going to be tendering the design to multiple sub trades, and so we'll be ex um, not only achieving competitive pricing when we go to market for the uh, for the contractor, uh, but for each of the sub trades, there'll be competitive pricing as well. So that will that will work to um, maintain the. And the how's, their, how's their fee calculated? Uh, fee will be on a percentage, so we're going to. Um, uh, it's actually going to be on a sliding percentage, and we will do a, a calculation of the total estimated fee based on the project estimated project cost. But if the cost goes overrun, do they get a bigger fee then? They would. Their fee would increase based on what the final cost is, and given that we don't know exactly what the scope of the work is, it's difficult for us to say it's going to be 125 million. It could be 150 or 175 million at this stage. So we want to make sure that we have flexibility built into the fee calculation. So um, next slide, the recommendation. Conclusion, construction management provides the uh, highest score, um, achieves project requirements. Um, next, yeah, so recommendations of adopt the CM approach. Next. Uh, oh, I just approach. have another question, sorry, David. Yeah. How, how many uh, uh, bidders are we going to? We will do um, uh, RFQ, RFP, so it'll be our baffle process. So anyone who's qualified to bid, we expect to get bids on. It's a pretty, it's a very large job. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get six to eight. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good. Um, so recommendation, uh, motion please, Charmaine. Uh, yeah, roll, 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 roll this question. Roll. roll. Yeah, sure, just a quick question. I want to go back to the BMW for a second. I just want to understand what impact the BMW uh, dealership has on the project in terms of timing? And if BMW wasn't there, would we be doing anything different or would that impact our recommendation in any way? Uh, I'm not sure that it would impact the recommendation, although it is possible. And yes, we would be doing something different. It's, it's, it's likely that we would be proceeding um, with the project in a single phase and simply doing the flood protection landform from the embankment all the way up to uh, Eastern Avenue. So yes, the the you know BMW, the landowner uh, or the tenant and the landowner um, uh, do affect how the project is being um, delivered and constructed. And can you quantify the impact on timing broadly and cost? Um, I can I can get you that information. Um, the impact on timing to go from phase one to the final uh, flood protection is entirely dependent on the landowner determining that they want to demolish the building and proceed with development. So it could be five years, it could be 35 years. Um, obviously, we're not involved in that. Um, the timing of the project itself, the delivery of work. So we're, they're not liking what I'm saying. The um, the work that um, the work that we're undertaking um, is going to take would take probably the same amount of time the next two to three years, whether we're doing it in a phased basis and leaving a BMW where they are, or we're um, uh, removing BMW and then doing the additional work. Although I would say that um, you know expropriating, and that's what it would require, expropriating the BMW. Um, site would take quite some time. Um, it, it'll take um, somewhere between 12 and 24 months and no work could begin before that. So um, so that does that that would actually impact us having to uh, remove BMW from the equation. Last question, good quick follow up. If this is a two stage and BMW decides to sit on this, wherever the owner is for a while, do we still get the full benefits or the intended outcome of what we're trying to do in phase one? Yes, we do actually. The the majority of the flood protection is actually provided by the FPL that um, uh, spans the ramp from Eastern Avenue to the Don Valley Parkway. So when we put that in, there's a very, very minor spill through the Eastern Avenue underpass, um, but it really doesn't affect, you know, we get of the 240 hectares we expect, we probably get 230 hectares of flood protection. And the balance of it is is really confined to some roads in um, the south and eastern area. 
Great, thanks. Um, no other questions. I'm going to ask that the uh, motion be put up. Okay, and it's on the board. Okay. Uh, can I have a mover of that? Uh, Jack and seconded by Kevin. All in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Thanks, David. Great job and uh, good luck with it. Um, okay, we are now uh, going to go into closed session. So again, a, a motion to move into closed session. Um, okay, rule, thank you. Uh, seconded by Lori. Um, all in favor? Carried. So we're now back in the open session. The recording's been turned back on. So now we're going to pass the resolutions arising from the business from the closed session. Can I have a motion to approve the December 8th, 2022 board meeting closed session minutes? Is there a mover and a seconder? Kevin Alicia, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. And could I have a motion to approve the proposed amendments to the rolling five year strategic plan? Drew, thank Moved. you. And Lori or Jack, take your pick, Ian. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Carry. Thank you all for participating in the meeting. We've obviously covered a lot of important matters, and uh, I look forward to seeing everybody uh, at our meeting in June. And I'd now, having concluded the motion of the business, the best part of the meeting is to ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> so, so uh, great, Councillor Malik, and then seconded by Wendy. Okay, looks like I'll only get to do that one more time. <laughs> <laughs>